this is a, uh, uh, thanks for playing hooky with me because we're not going to be talking about work or anything that happened bad last week or the ancient code you were looking at or trying to figure out how things work. We're just going to relax and have some time out together for 45 minutes. Um, there's a lot of things because I'm very enthusiastic. I'm not going to get around to saying probably in this slide deck, uh, but this is a direct link to the slides. Um, and the repository of the examples is also on GitHub. So there's two links uh, you can use to kind of follow up. At the end of the slides, there's a bunch of resources of things I wish I could have gotten to. Uh, and I think most importantly, at the end of this talk, towards the end, just before questions, there's a code pen example with sort of like all the things we've sort of played with in this uh, talk. And code pen is a really great way to kind of just you know, if you've got 10 minutes between gigs or something, just open up CodePen, play around. It's sort of therapeutic, okay? Um, before I get started, is this a JavaScript room, or is this sort of like a design room? How many designer people? And how about JavaScript people? And how about educator people? Awesome, cool. Um, I don't know if you guys remember this, or if you were around for this, but Spirograph was a wonderful toy, uh, and uh, it was a great way to make, uh, to do art. It was a tool that helped you do art, and you were instantly successful, even if you didn't know what you were doing. And it was always kind of a surprise what was going to happen. It wasn't immediately apparent what shape would be made. So a little element of surprise in this toy, ostensibly for children, um, who produce output kind of like this, uh, beautiful abstract forms um, with the different colors. And this is kind of the spirit of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, but this talk is about more than that, actually. It's about, uh, and it's a light introduction to creative coding, which is kind of a, a discipline uh, that you actually go to school for. People who study information, visualiz data visualization, kind of do some of this work, too. In fact, some of this talk is actually pulled out of uh, an evening class I was teaching at Northeastern for graduate students who were designers, who were going into a, uh, a visual uh, a design class for um, interactive, interactive graphics and whatnot. This talk is totally appropriate for newbies. Um, we're not going to get in the weeds, but it, it does kind of... Uh, the goal is to get anybody excited to go play with CodePen and just try things. You don't have to... Like, all the boilerplate's done, you just kind of tweak things, right? Most importantly, it's for cranky old-timers who are <laughs> done with working with, like, 20 files and 40 frameworks and trying to figure out how to talk to the database. This is basically a, a meditation on how to remember how to enjoy programming. Um, and I hope that if you are an educator, that you consider this tasty mix of instant design feedback coupled with code, right? So that you have visual feedback of, about the concepts you're teaching. Uh, here's the details. So we're going to be using the Canvas 2D API. This link is to MDN, so the, the Mozilla Developer Network documentation is very good. Um, we're going to be using raw JavaScript, old raw JavaScript, so stuff that would look familiar to somebody writing JavaScript circa 2000. We're going to make some live mistakes, hopefully. Uh, and we're going to talk about some visual tricks, sort of like things that... So I'm used to teaching this to designers who don't code, and now maybe I'm teaching to coders who are less experienced with the tricks, the dirty tricks of design, so we'll make, get into a few of those. A little art history at the end, like I said some summary information, uh, where to go next. <clears throat> oh yeah, we're going to be making stuff like this. So, and stuff like this. Um, so, I think I touched on this a little bit already, but I, I do believe that there is there's a, a learning process that happens when you're at play that doesn't happen when you're at work. When you are free to make whatever kind of mistake you want, and you're doing it just to be there, to enjoy the moment, to... to uh, learn in a non-judgmental place. I think uh, I think you can learn a lot in those circumstances where you celebrate happy accidents. And this, of course, is all extremely good for your brain. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Mitchell Resnick teaches lifelong kindergarten at the MIT Media Lab, and <clears throat> I think this quote is really applicable. Uh, so play isn't just an activity; it's a way of doing anything. Right. <clears throat> so. I would like us to imagine bringing play into our jobs, into what we do. And, and I think, again, this meditation might help us do that. So we recognize this place. This is UMass, circa 1975. This is where 
I first learned about computers. My mother was a computer science major back then, and this is what, oops, yeah. This is what that sort of looked like. It would be like rooms full of these things that were really loud. They were, <laughs> um, <clears throat> they were really pretty slow, actually. That was a little too fast. <laughs> More like that. Um, and when nobody's looking, I would get on them and draw pictures, you know. I'd like, because these characters, could, the terminals allowed you to go back over characters that had already been typed with some precision, so you can make different shapes, and I played around with that quite a lot. So computers, like I grew up with computers, and my mom being a computer science major, I was in her classrooms. Uh, she was a single parent, so that's why I was in the classrooms. Um, and I really enjoyed playing around with them, and eventually sort of learned how to program through osmosis, mostly being abandoned in computer labs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then like high school came around and I actually got very interested in photography and drawing and I ended up going to, this slide is just to remind me that I went to art school and <laughs> so I did go to art school I never met Marcel Duchamp but he was definitely an interesting figure for me because you know three or four years of art school things start to get really weird like, and he was very pivotal for me in terms of imagining what creativity is all about what art is all about, what expression is about very different from where I would come from um, so around, so like this, what's also interesting to me is it never occurred to me in the 80s that these were two reasonable pursuits that could happen at the same time. You could be interested in art and design, and you could be interested in computers, because in the 80s, computers were a little weird. You know, they weren't, um, first of all, very accessible, and they were kind of, they weren't, today we embrace digital technology with abandon, but pretty much in the 80s, if you're into computers, you were kind of a nerd, okay. <laughs> but not in a good way. It was not great. <laughs> Uh, there were, however, people who were working with computers to do beautiful plots like, that were you know, exhibited in Europe um, by writing computer code. They'd write code, it would produce a plot output, they'd put it in the gallery. That was like as early as 1965, and there's a huge tradition around it. There's a lot of artists who did it. But if you look, actually, these two examples, they come from math. Uh, actually, I didn't have the engineering guy in here, but math and en engineering mostly. The exception is Vera Molnar. She was an artist, a printmaker, a Dutch printmaker, who was fantastic. She, her aesthetic was computer design before she got her hands on a computer. Um, so she was into sort of repetition. Uh, she was into grids. She was into minor variation, like make a million things, see the tiny variations, celebrate those little differences. So this is actually one of her plotter prints. Um, I think it's in the 70s. <clears throat> I'm going to come back to this, I think, but keep her in mind, she has a few, you know, there's a theme of emerging here, like a grid with random variation inside the grid, slightly broken down grid. Um, but she was one of the few that came from a fine arts background to the computers. Uh, anybody know who this is? This is a, debatably, another early computer artist, but this is Saul LeWitt, and what he was programming was people which is super cool. So if you could actually go, I think for a while now, there's going to be an exhibition up at Mass Mocha, I think for like a couple decades. Yeah, through yeah. 2023 at least. I think so, they just extended it. For people who don't know, he would write instructions for uh, his collaborators, just random people mostly. And they would say stuff like, and they would say very specific recipes for producing a, a design on a wall, and they were called his wall drawings. And this is actually very common to use now when you're teaching basically... Um, aesthetics and computation or creative coding, people, you know, especially if you're looking at um, design and fine art as a vehicle to teach programming, we start with Saul LeWitt very often because it's prescriptive, procedural, and I think it gives people a taste for it. You can actually take a Saul LeWitt prescription for a wall drawing and turn it into uh, code. So that's a lot of fun. Um, later on in life, I became aware that these things can be merged. So sort of like in the 90s uh, and 2000s, um, there was a growing community out of the Media Lab. Um, this is actually the work of John Maeda, who taught at the Aesthetics and Computation Group at the Media Lab. And he was, he really, and his students in particular, really kind of took the idea of creative coding and put it in the mainstream. Uh, they developed processing, so Ben Fry and Casey Ray, under... John's guidance. John did a few things similar before that to get his students, mostly designers, familiar with programming uh, called Design by Numbers. It was a similar kind of like sandbox environment where 
you don't have to know too much to sort of get this feedback loop going, where the designer is playing with code, the code's telling the designer something, um, changing the idea of the designer. Anyway, um, he came out of Muriel Cooper's uh, research group, and she was very famous for like a lot of digital typography experiments. But I didn't know any of this right away until I was working at the Media Lab, met John, and became one of his students. Anyways, we're going to go back to this. Uh, we're going to look at various print here a little closer and talk about what it is, um, just for a second, because we're going to try to... I find that when I'm going to do a creative endeavor, it's nice to have a starting point that's well-defined, and you may leave that starting point, but looking around, casting around for inspiration is uh, a really worthwhile thing to do before you head out. And so oftentimes in my classes, I will give the students a specific um, painting, design, uh, to work from, and oftentimes it's from some of the early experimenters because it's accessible, and I think they were super mindful of the medium they were working in. Anyway, so in this case, what we see is like obviously columns and rows. We also see a kind of like a Z order of these uh, similar shapes. And I think, like I said before, the important thing is that there is regularity and there's also irregularity. That's a nice balance, right? There's sort of like a little bit of chaos, right? If it was just a bunch of concentric squares, I think we might be bored. In fact, it wouldn't even probably read like this. It would probably read more like a pattern, right? Where this really feels like a composition with things going on. So let's keep those things in mind. There's like iteration and three dimensions, mostly. And there's subtle variation in the design. So those are some ideas to think about as we kind of start off on this journey. <clears throat> Sorry, very thirsty. <laughs> All right, um, an important thing, I think, so for many people who are, have drawn on any kind of graphic system, usually the, the, the thing we know as people who've used these sort of systems before is the origins on the top left, very often, sometimes it's on like the bottom right. But anyways, it's never in the center, which is where math tells us to expect the origin to be. This kind of a big deal can get people confused, specifically because when you increase Y, you go down the monitor screen. So that's the thing to keep in mind. These coordinates matter as you're going to play with the canvas. So, math is coordinates, canvas coordinates. Just remember that usually, typically, the origin is in the top corner somewhere. In our case, in the web canvas, it's always going to be the top left. Uh, for all the exercises we're going to do here, there's a very simple template. Um, it basically, so, I've made some decisions, right? I've decided not to use frameworks, to use kind of old, plain JavaScript, and put it all on one page. Those are kind of unusual uh, decisions to make in today's web technology world. Typically, today, to build a single web page, you've got things that are pulling assets from various locations or compiling your JavaScript, loading things outside of the one page. So to make this sort of easier for a new person to get involved with and to sort of hand off as an artifact, there's a decision that's been made that we're just going to deliver the HTML and the JavaScript together. All right? And the main thing for total newbies here is that, you know, this bit here is HTML, and this bit between the script is the code we're writing. And basically, for our examples, nothing is changing except for the bit in the middle. So this is our template. Each sketch we do, we're just going to change the JavaScript. Our template is we're going to have a canvas element of a certain size. All right? So that's where we're starting from. The very first thing we're going to do, like, so... One of my advice to folks who are trying to just sort of start is get something on the screen as soon as possible. <laughs> just do whatever it takes to get your first toe in the water. So for our first experiment, we're just going to try to draw one simple square, right? Um, and to, to that end, this is basically, I'm going I'm to step back here for a second. I glossed over something. The other thing that we're going to always have is a way to get this thing called the context. This is where we're going to do all our painting. We can call it whatever we want. Here we're calling it context. So we don't have to get into the details of how we're getting this, but we're asking the browser to get us a reference point to draw in. So very easy, super easy way to draw a rectangle is just this one statement. Context, stroke, rect. No. So it's the left margin, the top margin, the width, the height. So that's the easy way, but we're not going to do it the easy way. <laughs> we're going to do it the hard way. Make a glass of water. Um, so if we could stop here and we'd draw, we'd have achieved our first goal of drawing our first square. 
But I would like to break it down just so we can talk about some of the technology underneath. So that's a perfectly fine thing. We're going to do it this way. We're going to set a, a stroke style. style. Uh, that's the color of the pen. We're going to begin a path, and then we sort of make lines there. First we move to a position, and then we draw a horizontal line, followed by a vertical line, followed by another horizontal line, and then we connect it back to the top. At the very end, this is important, we say stroke. So we've defined the shape here, this procedural derivative, we defined a stroke, and then we actually we define a shape, and then we ask it to stroke the shape with black. That's basically all you need to know. Oh, sorry. So that, that produces that, as we've said. The next challenge, the most next logical challenge is, okay, let's, what happens if we try to produce two squares? Well, we could do that same procedure again, like just copy and paste code, right, and change some of the numbers. And that's a naive thing to do, and actually probably a good thing if you're just learning. And actually I have many students who, when given these kind of challenges, would first just explicitly you know, list all the paths they want to make. And they wouldn't kind of be able to pull out the notion that we're doing the same thing multiple times. You know, we're doing this for each square. So let's, and, you know, we call this like, the way I like to teach this is, let's pretend you've got a magic function called draw square. We saw a stroke, right? But let's just imagine we have that. What would you like that magic function to look like? Well, you want to say where to draw it and how big it should be. And since it's a square, it's going to be just as tall as it's wide. So that's, that's what this slide is trying to get at, is we can generalize, you know, get them into the idea of building their own toolkit, making things easier, always trying to make things easier. And that gets us there. Even better is the idea that, in our case, with this particular piece we're trying to create, everything's going to be on a grid. So instead of adding you know, the, the grid width plus the grid margin every time, wouldn't it be nice just to be able to say, we want to draw a square in the third grid? You know, third from the left, first you know, zero width from the top, or whatever. So we modify our draw square function a little bit and allow it to understand the notion that we're just going to draw it on a given grid location, then our invocations become simpler. Oop, now it looks like this. In this case, you know, we can draw squares wherever we want. In this case, it's just elected for fun to draw them randomly on the grid, just to see what that looks like. Finally, we loop it. Um, you don't sit there all day and like do 16 calls to draw a square. So this is a good time to introduce the idea of iteration. And maybe, you know, arguably you introduce one loop at a time. In this case, we've, we've introduced two loops at once. And of course, that requires some explanation to talk about what's happening here. Because up until this point, we're sort of just going through code you know, top to bottom. So this is the first time we've got to address the idea that, oh, we're going we're gonna to loop around. We're going to actually do this outer part four times and then do the inner part four times. You know, Each time we do the outer part, that's 16 squares. right? So that looks like this. But look, this is a problem. We've already lost our way. We're doing pretty good but our margin's all wonky. And this is kind of a deep problem. Like, and, it, and it, you know, this requires some additional abstract thinking. How in general are we going to solve this problem? Because the, the print we're kind of deriving our inspiration from has many, many squares. We're kind of experimenting with 16, but it'd be great to have a, you know, a setup where we could uh, draw as many as we'd like, as many rows or columns. So this margin here is ugly, and it's only going to get worse, right? <laughs> So the question is, how do, we, how do we introduce some way to solve that problem? One way, there's many ways. You can, you can start to put numbers all over, you know, you can start adding things, and, but there's an easier way with the, the canvas. So you remember we've got this problem where we've got this origin. In a universe where the origin is in the middle, you can imagine it's easier to center things, right? If the origin is the top left, you're going to always be kind of fighting that top left. But if your origin is the middle of the time, you're going to be kind of empowered in a different way. You're going to have some new ideas of how to, how to work it. Um, so this is an important thing to know about the context is it has a notion of all these existing transforms on it. So if you've um, moved the canvas or if you've changed the pen color, it, it stores that in the context. And you can basically save it for later. And then later when you want to go back to how it was, let's say you were drawing with green for a while and you switched to red and you forget which green you were using, you can just call it context restore. It'll pop off your, your previous state. You can return to it pretty easily. So here's the, the, the main operations you do in the context. You translate, in this case, translating x and y each by two. These are like really big pixels, right? So 
translate x and y by two big pixels, you can scale in by a factor and rotate around the origin. But the point is you're always going to do your operations around the origin, typically. So the very first thing you want to do when you're doing these transformations is to change the origin to be where you want your rotation or your scaling to happen. Okay, there's a lot of code change here. And basically, this is all boilerplate. Um, the boilerplate is to make it big. So now we've got a situation where we can draw as many rows and columns as we want, and they're going to automatically be centered. And we can, and, and this all, it's a nice reasonable bit of code, but it is kind of a lot to go through, perhaps, for somebody who's learning. Um, the basic gist of it is there's a function to adjust the margins. There's a resize function, and when we change the window size, we're going to, you know, call the resize function, which is going to change the size of the canvas. And you have, that's actually a tricky bit to remember, is that the canvas doesn't just have an on-screen representation, it has a pixel re representation. So you've got to keep them in sync. Otherwise, you get, like, if you stretch out a photograph or something, you get weird artifacts, right? You start to get, uh, when you mess with the aspect ratio, your pixels start to get weird. So it's important to remember that when you do resize your canvas, you, you also um, adjust your context to match. There's a function called drawing grid, and this is another learning opportunity, perhaps, if, if you're teaching to folks. So draw in grid is basically a function that takes sort of a grid location and then some drawing function. So you can just say, I'm going to draw things in these grid cells. I'm not sure what I'm going to draw, but I'm going to use some drawing function. Maybe I'll draw a star, maybe I'll draw a circle. I don't know what I'm going to draw, but I'm going to draw it there. And, and that can be very powerful for, for doing... Um, you know, just to keep things sort of free, you know, as, you, as you're building up these systems that for playing, um, you kind of want to be able to free, free to be able to mess with these things. Um, the, last, the last thing I will say is more loops. So we've got the X and Y looping, and now we want to kind of do the, I don't know, the nested egg piece of their stuff. And in this case, there's no, whoops, sorry, there's no um, randomness introduced at all. And uh, as you can see, it's actually hard to see on this display, but there are concentric rings. Part of what's going on is we're scaling, so the actual line thickness itself is changing too. So it actually produces a sort of interesting result, but you see it's boring. It's deadly boring. It's very computer graphics e because there's no irregularity, there's no rhythm, there's nothing changing. It's like a static pattern. But we've done something. We've we've created a system where we can kind of fix some of this. So randomness and like stochastic process. It's pretty important for lots of art, actually. Like, it's, it's this traditional arts that celebrate the accidents, the hand of the artist. Like, little imperfections are celebrated everywhere. Um, and so it's reasonable to try to reintroduce those. So this is a good place to talk about random functions and how to kind of use them. In this case, we're modifying our draw square to nudge our endpoints, basically. We're wiggling our square uh, I think we've got four vertices on our squares. We're wiggling them. Uh, and that produces something that's slightly closer. We're still not there by a long shot, but we've got these squares that are not perfect. Uh, so in, instead of just being random, what happens if we kind of mix a little, sprinkle a little randomness on and sprinkle some directed variation? So like, as we go down in our you know, columns, our rows, maybe they'll get more wiggly, or maybe they'll get less regular, or, or something like that. So in this case, we start off very, uh, I'm sorry, this projector is crap. <laughs> there are actually multiple squares in here. Um, right. But anyway, what's happening, you cannot see it at all, I'm sorry. This is the, very, the first row, all the squares are pretty much centered. They're pretty much 100% centered and regular. They're all about the same size. And as we produce, go down, they get less regular and um, less centered, actually. And that's, if you remember the George Knees one, that was the squares that you saw, the square, the top row, they were all perfectly aligned. As they went down to the bottom of the grid, or the bottom, the grid fell apart, basically. So that's sort of where that inspiration came from. The other thing I want to say, a good quick teach of, uh, cheat is to use a color system that makes sense. Don't use RGB, that's random. Like, who can conceive of, like, change walking through our space? Like, you walk through lights and darks, right, and saturations and, and values. So HSLA is a great 
That's not a, it's a, I think it's fine. It's an adequate color space. <laughs> where you talk about the hue in terms of where it is in the color wheel, the saturation is how vivid that color is, and the lightness, how bright it is, how much energy comes off it. One of the weird things about the canvas you've got is that colors are represented just as strings, and they're basically CSS style strings. So you can use whatever. You could use rose as your color, and the string rose, and it would evaluate to something. But in this case, we make a helper function to get colors in a reasonable way. We expect you know, saturation and lightness to, to be a value between 0 and, and 1. Wait, yes. <laughs> right? We were saying alpha value, we were saying saturation value. Um, and then we're kind of, and because we've got a color space that makes sense, we can do sensible things with color. We can, mod we can modulate color based on where we are drawing uh, algorithmically pretty simply. This would be much harder to do in RGB space, right? Um, okay. <laughs> okay. So now I think it's like reasonable to start our exploration. We've kind of got our mind around some of the design principles that lead us to enjoy Vera's work. And now I think it's a place to depart from, right? So what happens if we start using spirographs for the, the, on the grid? Instead of, instead of using squares, what happens if we use you know, polar shapes, roundy shapes? And there's a bunch of ways to think of this, but the way I ended up doing it, so a very typical way is to, hold on, okay, to do this. To just convert your, your, in your code somewhere, your tracking angles, and you're, when you're doing points to draw your polygon, you're like, okay, I want to sweep a circle. And you do a transformation that's called polar to Cartesian. And you basically derive your x and y values based on the cosine and sine of the angle, theta. But that's pretty mathy and weird. Instead, you can just use context.rotate and you'll be fine, right? So that's what we're doing. <clears throat> and it's a matter of taste. Some people will definitely, by the way, think that that polar to Cartesian is the way to go. For me, the way I was conceiving it, this was the way to go, because I already had code to draw things in the center of the, in different places in the grid. I was already messing with the axes. So the procedure for generating snowflakes is roughly like this. You kind of translate your canvas so that the origin is in the middle of where you want to draw your snowflake or your spirograph design. So now your origin is in the middle, you can then rotate. But before you rotate, just drop a point. So move to some location on the canvas. That location, by the way, is going to be 0, comma y. Always, when you drop a point. You're at 0, y, you're going to put a point down. You're going to rotate your canvas. Your point has now moved. Your canvas has moved. So the next time you do 0, comma y, it's going to be just over, right? So you rotate your canvas again. Oops, something went wrong here. No one that. You rotate your canvas again here and do a line 2. Same here, you rotate your canvas, do a line 2. And pretty soon you're in business, you're cooking. You can do some things with symmetry, right, if you want, optional. So that's how you make snowflakes. Uh, this, so there's no symmetry here. This one is just kind of going around, making some circles, the procedure just described. Um, so you notice this one's smooth, right? So I've constrained how, how much y can vary, right? I've sort of, in my example, I was saying you're always at x0, and you've got some y component, and you're dropping your endpoints. So in this case, I was going for a more round shape, so I didn't let y change too much, kept y kind of constant. or within the bounds. And in this case, I said, all right, great, we'll just, we'll go crazy with the Y. And we added some symmetry, right? So that's kind of how we can do radial drawing. And I think, yeah, so what does that look like? Oh, yeah, that's just what I showed. Never mind, we saw that already. <clears throat> OK. When you put some of these ideas together, you can end up with stuff like this that looks really bad on this monitor. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, you know, Top left, we've only got three radial, ra radii that we're working with when we're drawing a polygon. So that's a three, three uh, sided polygon, a four sided polygon, a five sided, six. So in this direction, we're adding points for a polygon. In this direction, we're adding several things. We're changing the, we're changing the intensity of the color, the, actually, we're increasing the darkness, I guess, reducing the light. And then, you know, that kind of stuff. The other thing that's going on. That's a bit tricky and hidden. And when you guys go to look at this code and mess around with it and remix it yourself, you'll see these aren't all purely random. Like, there's contours. Like, in other words, let's see. Let me go back one, maybe. Well, what's going on is these are concentric. So this is really hard to see on that. 
see if this. Yeah. Nope. Okay. You have to look at it close and on your own. The shapes basically are the same as they. You know, we make smaller and smaller copies. We retain the shape. In this case, you don't have to. Um, all right. And then finally, there's. Uh, I put this in because I think people. I am pretty much into static imagery. But I think people learn about Canvas because they're interested in animation, right? So animation, you know, animation is basically like you clear the screen, you draw again. <laughs> That's basically what it is. So there's a demo for that, and, and also the GitHub repository includes that. So in this case, we're just rotating our shape um, repeatedly after clearing the screen. So we basically uh, draw our shapes, we clear the screen, we rotate everybody, we draw the screen clear the screen just over and over again. Um, yeah, so I want to switch to, if I can find the, just give me a second, I'm going to go to the beginning of this. If that was smart, I would have put a bookmark. Or something. Okay, so I'm going to go to CodePen now, where we can kind of play with this. This exists, it's online, there's a URL you can play with, you can remix it, you make it yourself. This is the same code, and what I basically just wanted to show is how it can actually be playful. Like, um, there's variables right at the top that basically how big is your grid, uh, and how how much of the grid is occupied, how big is the margin. In this case, the margin is basically non-existent. That variable should probably be renamed as basically one over margin or something. This is the spacing between grid cells. So if we make it really tiny, uh, and we save this guy, our our polygons are tiny. It, what happens if we make it really big, like twice as big as it's supposed to be? Well, then they start to overlap. And again, happy accidents are abound, right? I'm going to return to uh, a reasonable size and make many, many. Oh, no, not 100. That's a bad idea. But <laughs> I did make 100 for a second. Let's do it again. It's going to survive. All right, there's 100. Yes. And this is kind of the power. Like, So once you've kind of set yourself up, and by the way, I had a lot of fun making each iterative step. It was fun for me. It was like problem solving. I was drawing. Um, and like presenting it maybe is a little dull. Like kind of feels like a lesson or a lecture. But while you're doing it, you can play around and learn a lot. Um, anyways, the point is you can come in and uh, change some of these parameters around. Um, like let's do something sort of interesting. In this case, the color space is going from red to green. We can make that wider or uh, narrower uh, by just adjusting, so let's see. We're, here's we're saying the, the Vera square is the name of the descending smaller objects we're drawing on the screen. They're not squares anymore, but, and we're setting the color, for instance. And we're setting uh, a range for the color. So again, in, uh, in the color space of zero to one, where zero is red, and purple is one. Um, we're, we're kind of picking colors between zero and 21. And we can just change it. We can make a much wider color spectrum by just changing that to nine. And then we get kind of like a rainbow. It's pretty ugly. Or we can constrain it even further, like make it a smaller color space, and they're much more closely uh, color aligned. So that's what I'd like to say. You can play with this. Um, and ha please, have at it. Do it while we're talking. Do it during questions. Um, it is, by the way, at least question time. <laughs> I want to, if it's okay, uh, I, please take a look at the um, the rest of the slides as you as you can. Um, there's good references there for um, sorry um, for the uh, uh, reference documentation for Canvas. I do kind of want to actually call out. Please um, let me see if I can. I'm just going to go straight to it. Uh, there's a couple pages I want to call out in particular. <coughs> Um, there are folks on Twitter and on YouTube who do a lot of this and are good teachers and um, have fun challenges. So uh, let's see. Okay, uh, there's links to this stuff. These are some great people to follow, uh, either on um, Twitter or on YouTube. Daniel Schiffman has really, really taken as his mission to teach everybody how to code and do beautiful things. Um, Inconvergent is like way more advanced, but super friendly and does really interesting, like super interesting plots. And same with this fellow too. Um, I don't actually know who that is, but I don't know the real name is what I should say. And Solving Saw is a, where, is a GitHub repository where people submit their, um, their wall solutions. So they, they follow the imperative given by Solowit and they produce 
renderings either in Canvas or in processing or WebGL or something. Uh, oh yeah, there's a lot of things like that. Let's see. Yeah, there's there's great websites that are linked somewhere in here to um, Shader Toy, which is another remixing site where people are doing crazy things with uh, fragment shaders and stuff. Where you can basically, and they're like really trippy, like 3D visualizations, and you can just tweak parameters and um, have a good time playing with that. You basically like make a copy of their thing and change numbers. You'll have, honest to God, a great time. Um, we didn't do anything about frameworks for the web, mostly because I wanted to, when I. I've done things with D3 and folks in the past, and they pretty much get hung up on a lot of D3 idiosyncrasies and, um, and then don't really know how to implement it on their own. So, Any questions or things you guys want to look at? Or uh, any com Yeah, any questions or things you'd like to see? <laughs> I'm curious what sort of performance you see in writing in Canvas versus using like animation um, using like CSS animation properties. Yeah, that's I haven't like benchmarked it at all. You can get crazy performance out of Canvas though. Like so, in my day job, we do simulations and stuff, and and, and you know WebGL is pretty blazingly fast on the Canvas. So Canvases have a 2D API and a 3D API, and um, you can get pretty fast. So it outperforms SVG for sure, um, because you're not manipulating DOM nodes. You're just painting stuff on the screen. Right? So I, I don't know. So I would think that CSS translate. Tr I don't know how that works. Yeah. Anybody know? You can <laughs> speak up. But CSS transform may use the uh, graphic accelerator. Yeah. Part, so some might be faster on my like mobile and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I see them as kind of like different, depending on what you're doing. Kind of like different spaces, maybe. You know. I mean, if you're transitioning, yeah. I don't know. I really, so the difference I see, like Canvas, I think of a universe where you don't really retain a reference to the things you draw. You just kind of like putting stuff on the screen. And there are toolkits that can help you with that. Like if you want to maintain a reference to a sprite or something, you can look at uh, 2D Canvas API toolkits. I'm trying to think of the name of one. Uh, Raphael. Quite a, Raphael, that's, no, that's SVG. Uh, it used to be Kinetic.js. Yeah. But anyway, I think it is fair to use, you know, if uh, if you're interested in doing performancey things, to so look at what kind of frameworks exist, depending on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to like move similarly shaped objects over and over again, you might look at something uh, like some framework that wraps something. Like so, for instance, for the Canvas 3D API, it's unwieldy. Like it's pretty hard. But there's a thing called 3JS, which basically provides you with a nice graph, a scene graph interface to a 3D world. So you can manipulate cameras and manipulate your meshes and stuff from a higher uh, order, I guess, higher level, yeah. Any questions? Anybody disappointed we didn't do spirograph literally? I'm, kind of, I'm a little disappointed, but I ran out of time and, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. What's the um, last thing you mentioned that you said was really cool? What was the name of uh, Probably 3JS, I'm not sure. So I think 3JS was pretty cool. Lots of things are cool. I'm very enthusiastic. <laughs> like most things are pretty cool. Um, is there something? Oh, oh yes. Uh, Shader Toy. Oh, oh yes. Thank Shader you. Toy. Shader Toy is a lot of fun. Uh, let's just go there. What the heck? Shader Toy. Uh, so, it's going to break me. So people submit shaders, and shaders are basically, they're not in JavaScript. They're in like weird um, WebGL shader language. Um, but uh, they're super performant because of how, uh, because they're basically writing to your graphics card. They're using, they're exploiting features of your graphics card that do really, really fast matrix multiplication. This one's pretty boring, frankly, for shaders. Um, let's see if I can find like shader of the week or something. Featured shaders. Anyway. Come, come to Shader Toy, play around yourself. I don't know why it's so slow here, probably because, I don't know. But they're, they're very interesting, and you can just change values, right? So I can just change something. I have no idea what's gonna happen if I change this to a three. Who knows, we'll try it. <laughs> Maybe nothing, perhaps nothing. So you can come here and play around with these things, and um, copy-paste is sort of like how the web was built in the 1990s, so come on. <laughs> you can do it. Uh, yeah, any other questions? Did you ever try the using Greensock? Mm-mm. 
That's, uh, What's that? It, it can, it's really good for developing timelines and kind of more of this like CSS transform kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I was able to do a good like three-dimensional quick kind of text effect with it. It was really, or it runs really smoothly. Nice. Unless you do complex timelines with things. And I think there's a couple ways to connect it to Canvas, but it's really... Well, there are more at SVG types. There are great tweening libraries. So, in other words, tweening is basically when something, when a property is modified over time, uh, that's a, a tweening thing. And I didn't go into the slide. I didn't present a slide about how animation is done. But the general recipe is: you ask the browser, "Let me know when when you're going to repaint the screen. Like, <laughs> like just let me know." And you give it a, a pointer to your function for drawing. And the first argument that thing gets is like the time. And so you can kind of look at how much time has gone by. And, and a tween function is like, given a starting point of zero and an ending point of one, um, you know, what is like 50% of some value? Like give, given a start and end range. Or, and, and you can do a linear tween or you can do an exponential tween where like when you ask for 50%, you're not going to get 50% value. You're going to get what that value would be at 50% of the time, right? And if it's an ease-in operation, you're not going to be anywhere near. 50% uh, done. So tween libraries are cool. And you can use them with Canvas, you can use them with anything, because they're basically just simple JavaScript libraries where you say, hey, the, give me a value that is like 90% through this exponential graph, and let me know what it is. <laughs> I, I think, um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, I think you kind of touched on this a little bit, but what is the benefit of doing art in this manner as opposed to like sketching with a touch screen and yeah, mechanical, like mechanical pencil or... I, 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 didn't, I used to have, my original slide was like sketch all the time. So like, I believe sketching is a process that this is one of. Like if you were an illustrator, drawer, or painter, uh, a visual designer, then your sketching for sure would happen all the time on pen and ink. And I actually believe as a, as a coder I sketch on paper too. But if, what happens if you take the idea of what sketching is and you say, I can sketch in other mediums, and one of the mediums I can sketch in, in other words, create quick disposable studies, because that's what a sketch is, right? It's like, I am not committed to this, but I don't care about this, I can throw this away. That's a sketch. What if you can do that in code? So using like code pen or something, you can try an experiment, and if it works for you, right? Yeah, but, but I know many of these people who do, so the links I had to Inconvergent and those other kind of, kind of like, uh, creative coders out there, they do sketch all the time. And actually, oftentimes on Twitter, they'll post their sketch first, like the thing they're trying to do, and then they'll post iterations of like how it's going, you know, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so I often do start on paper. In this case, I just stole somebody else's idea and started there. <laughs> right? I took various, I'm like, that's a great sketch. We're going to move from there. Right? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Would you also say part of the process that's different is when you're, when you're sketching with a pencil or like physically controlling it, and it's more predictable, whereas this, it kind of takes a lot more processing. And stuff. <coughs> that's a really good question. Like, I definitely do things like this because, well, that's a good question, good point, right? But when you sketch, you sometimes have accidents too, right? Right. Depending on what you're trying to do, like. But I, I don't think, so, so like if I'm sketching ideas for like a logo or something, sometimes I think I know what I'm doing, but sometimes I, I, I make a mistake and it's kind of like, oh, that's sort of interesting. I didn't control it super well. I'm not like in the highly refined phase. I'm like in the ideation phase and I'm like, ah, the head kind of looks like this. Oh, that's a weird head. Let's try a few like that. Um, that's not quite what you're asking, but I, I, I understand like this idea of immediacy. Like it feels really immediate to draw on paper. Right. I think given time, you'll find it becomes more immediate. Like you didn't, you know, first pick up a pencil and we're like, I'm on it. I totally yeah. know what I'm doing. <laughs> and if I think about some painters I know and stuff, like they're constantly learning the limits of their medium and the medium is telling them stuff. Like they're learning what paint does. Like they're not sure at first. They're playing with it. And they have to have that positive, I think, positive attitude about like, I'm going to make mistakes and it's going to be frustrating, but I'm going to continually learn what paint wants to do or what paint and I want to do together, right? right? And this must provide more surprises. I mean, all the time it must be like, oh my god, I had no idea well, how to do that. Well, I guess so, because you could change one character. Right. You know, like a typo, and you're like, wow, that's totally not what I was doing, but that's great. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, that, the discovery is great. Yeah. Yeah, so please play. Next time you're tempted to, like, zone out and watch YouTube at work, just <laughs> open up CodePen and, you know. Right. <laughs> cool. Uh, Thanks very much. I don't really know what time it's supposed to end, but it might be about now. I think four, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh,
Hoşçakalın.